Good morning. My name is Dorothy Larson, Larson and Associates CPAs, honored to be chairing the committee that puts on this program and member of the board of directors at the chamber. Oh, if I keep talking, you'll sit down. Yay. <laughs> so we are very excited to have a full program this morning and to have Michelle Steele here from now, the Board of Supervisors. But before we get to introducing Michelle, I'd like to bring up Jeffrey from Edible Arrangements, which we've been enjoying this morning, that fabulous, beautiful arrangement back there. And then I will bring up Steve Rosansky. Thanks. Hi, good morning. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, again, my name is Jeffrey Hirata, Edible Arrangements Costa Mesa. And thank you for enjoying the be beautiful bouquet I brought in. Um, just wanted to let you know that we have a brand new product line called Edible To Go. And you can come in and there's some indulgent treats you can enjoy right there on the spot. It's not necessarily gift giving products, but like banana splits, um, some fresh fruit salads, some things you can enjoy right there and there. Um, we are located in Harbor and Wilson in the city of Costa Mesa and we deliver to all of the beautiful city of Newport Beach. Thank you very much. Sounds good. Banana splits. We have a lot of really important people here this morning and I'm going to introduce Steve Rosansky, the president of the Chamber of Commerce, to introduce them. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy, and welcome to good I was going to say good morning, Newport. Wake up, Newport. <laughs> Actually, we have a competitor now. We have, what is it, good morning, Corona Del Mar. So uh, I have to keep it straight. In any event, uh, thank you all for coming. We have a few um, dignitaries with us. I think we actually have a Brand Act violation here. We have five of the council here this morning. So we have the mayor, Ed Sellett. <laughs> mayor Pro Tem, Diane Dixon. Uh, Councilman Keith Curry, uh, Councilman Scott Piotter, way in the back, and I think this is his first appearance, Councilman Duffy Duffield. All right, thanks for coming. Oh, were you here? That's true, you were here for the debate. That's right, I forgot. Okay, this is his second appearance. First as an official city councilman. Uh, we also have with us this morning uh, Police Chief Jay Johnson. And Planning Director Kim Brandt. And I think we have one Harbor Commissioner, Paul Blank. I don't know if I forgot anybody. If I did, please excuse me. So I'm going to turn it back over to Dorothy. I'm sorry. Oh, here, did you sneak in at the last? There he is. Here's Swan with the Irvine Ranch Water District. He's directly there. Did you get that mess cleaned up at uh, Von Karn and MacArthur? Oh. Biggest swing pool in Irvine. There you go. Um, okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Dorothy. I'll have a few comments at the end. Hope you enjoy the program. Thank you. Hey, and Dorothy Larson, president of the Newport Beach Public Library Foundation. Oh. <laughs> Apparently the foundation being a volunteer thing doesn't count. <laughs> so I am really honored to be here this morning to introduce Michelle Steele. She is our um, recently elected assembly, or, sorry, assembly. <laughs> Orange County Supervisor, very important local position that is very, very important to us. Previously, as you know, she was on the Board of Equalization. And you may or may not be aware, if you're a small business owner, you probably are very aware of Michelle's presence with the Board of Equalization. There's an increased effort to uh, control sales tax for businesses, which is really important and appropriate. And there was also, uh, spearheaded by Michelle, a refund of a lot of deposits that were kept by the Board of Equalization, apparently a lot longer than they should have been. And she did some very good, strong, diligent work at the Board for uh, small business taxpayers and, as, and has earned a reputation as the taxpayer advocate. So we're really pleased to have a taxpayer advocate in government. Michelle uh, graduated from Pepperdine and USC, loves to travel, most recently to Belize for a big birthday celebration with family, and that's a wonderful place to celebrate. And obviously has traveled to Japan and Korea because she's fluent in those languages and um, lived in Japan for a while, I believe. 
In any case, I would love to introduce Michelle Steele, our Orange County Supervisor. Thank you, Steve, for inviting me here today, and I'm very much honored to be here. Um, you know, we introduce most important people, but let me introduce one person that you have to know because when I am not around, that this person is always around my staff, uh, Tim Whitaker, right there. So you have to get his business card, the, his personal cell number. No, just kidding. Maybe, yes. <laughs> So, you know, just get him because, you know what, he's a, a problem solver in my office, so I'm very much grateful. And, Diane, nice seeing you. It seems like we have a brown act, so we cannot discuss anything about it, and I'm not going to get any questions from city council members. But I can talk, so that's going to be good. Um, as you can hear that I was born in Korea and raised in Japan, and I came here to go to college. Um, my character is like typical Asian woman that I was very much quiet and I was a very shy person and you know I used to I was raised in Japan the first day I went I went to public school at uh, the private school but uh, there's a boys and girls school I used to go to all girls school in Korea so I couldn't go to the bathroom because I have to pass the hallway with all these boys standing there I don't have brothers that you can you know you know so I was very shy and I never thought that I'm running for public office. You know, there's just, just no way that, you know, I'm thinking about speaking in front of people and, you know, like this. And, and my character has been changed so much. But only one thing that made me run for public office. My mother, my father passed away in Japan. So my mother came here as a single mom with three daughters that she tried to raise. She was a teacher all her life in Korea and Japan. So she didn't speak English a word. So she opened a clothing shop by help by her friends. So we opened a clothing shop in downtown Los Angeles and then you know, she tried to run. It's a seven days a week and it's long hours. I used to go to 7 o'clock class in Pepperdine. It's long in Malibu. Coming back to downtown Los Angeles and worked all day and I went back to the you know, night class. That's the way first generations run. You know, you work 14 to 16 hours a day and try to survive. So after mom ran for a clothing shop for a few years and she decided to run for some sandwich shop. It's a building inside sandwich shop. It's much shorter hours and she wants to spend more time with the three girls. And she opened the, closed down the clothing shop and then she opened the sandwich shop. A few months later, I guess somebody sent a letter out to her that you used to pay sales tax this much, but you didn't pay enough last year during the Christmas season. When you ready to close down, guess what happened? Inventory goes down. So you paid all the taxes accordingly, but Board of Equalization never thought about the common sense. So they hit her with the taxes, and then you cheated. So interest and penalty on the top of it. You know, first generation, when you get a letter from tax agency, what do you do? You just pay the taxes, whatever they ask for. That's exactly what they did. So my husband said, don't make her mad. She's going to be your boss someday. That's exactly what happened. So I ran for Board of Equalization. And you know, with the compassion, you just run. And you get there, and then you see a lot of nonsense going on. That's exactly what Dorothy was talking about, security deposit. When you open a clothing shop or any retail shop, and you don't have any credit, then you have to deposit up to $5,000. If you small business owners are here, then you know that when you open the shop, you need more money than ever. But instead of that, you have to deposit up to $5,000 to the tax agency, and they're supposed to give you that back in three years. So these businesses, when they ask your refund, guess what tax agency is the worst word? Refund. So instead of refund, they started auditing these small businesses. So I found out in first quarter, first three months of my term at BOE, I found out that board was hoarding $42 million. We returned everything. And actually, before I stepped down from BOE, we actually eliminated that program and we returned over $400 million to the taxpayers. And 
you don't have to make any more deposits if you are willing to open any cloning shop. So that's what happened. So last year, I don't want to be assemblywoman here because in California you don't have any power, but I've been working with tax payers. I thought supervisor is a good job because you can work with residents one by one. And under my district, we have 10 cities, and Newport Beach is one of the one. And we can work with the council members, Keith Curry sitting here, and Scott Pieter just got elected at the same time as me. And you know, we all work together. So that's, I think, better for me than try to make some really silly laws in Sacramento. So I ran, and I won. It's very tough to work with staff because, you know, I totally forgot. The first couple of years in, at BOE, they gave me a lot of attitude. You are here for four or eight years, and then after that, you are going to be gone. But I'm going to be here forever, that kind of attitude for staff giving you. So one of the mem you know, meeting that one of the actually high position person, he was just challenging me in public meeting. Every time that you know, I say something, that he was challenging me and he tried to stop me. So I, you know, last eight years I've been experienced working with or fighting with all these attorneys. I'm not actually putting attorneys down if you're attorneys because I've been living with one for the last 33 years, but I know them very, very well. So I pulled the ham in the side and then, you know, I said, Mr. Such Such, you know what? Don't make me mad in public meetings. I am a Korean American woman. I have a very hot temper. And I speak Korean as first, Japanese my second, and English my third. When I get mad, you don't know what kind of language is going to be. <laughs> so you're going to regret to hear it, and I'm going to regret to say it. So stop challenging me in public meetings. He stopped doing that from that on. So it was a really tough start, but it's kind of fun because you can work with residents that, you know, covering top potholes to, you know, millions of dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars, the budget that, you know, you are giving to sheriff and, you know, fire department and, you know, all these uh, DA's office. It's, it's really good working <coughs> with people. So let me get into Newport Beach. There's only a couple of issues. Every time I come to Newport Beach, you guys are grilling me. I mean, you know, so I sat down with actually Duffy and uh, Scott, uh, one of the breakfast meetings that, you know, we tried to talk about Harbor Petrol me, you know, that how are we going to save that money? I've never seen Duffy talks anywhere. He's been so quiet, but when Harbor comes, he talks. The whole breakfast, actually, he talked all morning that I've never seen him. He talks so much. He's so passionate. So contract is up, and city of Newport Beach, your five city council members that are here, so let me know that if I'm wrong. You guys asked for six months uh, extension so you can do RFP going out there. These city council members, they try to save money for your taxpayers' money, so they really want to go out there, then how much we can save. So. That RFP is going to show us the price, that how much it's going to cost, how much expenses that you know we can reduce because the new contract that Sheriff gave you are much higher than last contract. Is that right? So we want to talk to you that two things. One, <laughs> city is going to take over for harbor operations. Actually, they do that in Catalina Island, and that works there. Or second, non-uniformed people, because I heard that one of the Duffy boat was stolen, and all these sheriff went out, followed that five miles per hour boat with all these, the you know most modern, you know high skilled boat went out and chasing this boat, and after like one hour they stopped because no more battery, and they were just kind of surrounding the Duffy boat. I, the boat, and I was actually laughing with Duffy about that. And so we can save that money. So last week, actually, Supervisor Lisa Bartlett, that you know, who handles Dana Point, so she and I sat down. That how are we gonna make better that 
spend less taxpayers' money, but more professional and something really works. So cost-effective, professional, and how we're going to work with the harbor. So we are actually moving forward. Anything comes up because my staff are working on it right now, then I'm going to talk to city council members and mayor, and you know we can come up with a better solution. But meanwhile, we want to look at the price that you know what RFP is going to come up, and then we can actually compare the cost and how we can serve people better for safety, but at the same time, that less cost. That's why we are working on it. Second thing is 405 improvement projects. They're all talking about this all day long because all these toll lane, my God, raised the sales tax. If I was there, I was against it, but you guys all voted, so it's on you now. You're paying a little more sales tax there. And there's $1.3 billion available to build one lane. But when you're looking at the future, you want to build one more lane, it's going to cost another $100 million. So $1.4 billion, you can build two lanes for both, you know, both ways. But Caltrans comes in. I didn't know California. I was at the state level, but you know, I didn't know. State can be very much bullying the local government. They said, no, you have to build the toll lane. No matter what, OCTA is going to do whatever you want. We're going to build it no matter what. That's the way they put it. So we were against it. We were fighting. They said, no, OK, you know what? We're going to give you $82 million. I'm saying $300 million costing, and you're going to give us $82 million. Now, where we are is that who's going to control this toll lane? Who's going to gather that money, revenue, that who's going to control it? Because Caltrans is building it no matter what, and they're ready to give you $82 million to build a toll lane. So it seems like it's going that direction. If you have more questions, next time I'm going to bring OCTA staff and you know we're going to talk about details. But that's where we are at. Most important part of Newport Beach. You can guess, right? Airport. We have a Courtney here. Uh, okay. I, you know, Courtney, thank you very much. Courtney, can you stand up? Courtney Wirechuk is actually airport. She volunteered. I am so grateful. She came here with me today too. If I missed anything, but she's going to give you a little more details about FAA because you know what? She was a big key person to connect us to FAA because FAA decided that you know FAA is the one deciding all the flight path, right? Well, if you're Newport Beach residents, you all supposed to know that. If you don't know, you're newly moved, or you know, you just don't care much about it. But they're the one deciding all the traffic across the country. So they want to looking at the traffic. What noun is that they're looking at individual airport and they control the traffic that how it moves, then you know how they take off and how they land. But they decide that they want to have a broader you know, idea that, you know, views and looking at large areas. So they divide the Southern California area as a one division and they want to look at air travel, that how it's going to work called, um, I think it's a Metroplex, right? Yeah, Metroplex. So Metroplex includes John Way Airport, of course, Los Angeles and Ontario and all other areas. They want to have safety and efficiency. That's their goal, so they decide to have a metro class. But only problem is when they plan, they added some of the flight path that never had it in Newport Beach, the John Wayne Airport itself. So they just planned it, and they went to environmental <coughs> study, and they are not ex you know, including any stakeholders, people like you, that you know, we are sitting under the flight path, and you hear these noise, and then they try to build some of the you know, directions, flight path, 
that it's going to be narrower, then guess what? Maybe some people is going to be get out of the noise, but that one lane, that path coming in and out, they're going to have much more frequent noise, and you know, they are having it just much narrower than they were looking at it. But they are not really putting any stakeholders in for that meeting. So I asked, and Courtney really helped me from airport side. So we set the meeting with the FAA because we want them to hear our concerns because it's our lives that it's going to affect. They think in their idea that they are doing better job for air traffic, but they're not doing better job than how residents are getting in this noise. So we had a meeting in the first part of July, and you know, Courtney helped me bring them in. And Tony Petros, uh, he was there as a council member. And Tom Edwards, is he here? Tom, Tom Edwards was there. So tried to include city of Newport Beach that you know how much is going to affect and what's going to be done. They said, OK, this is the first time they said, OK, we're going to give you one month to give us uh, address the concerns. We strongly ask that we need at least two months so we can meet with residents, so we can get at that, you know, what residents' concerns are, and they have to put that into FAA future plan. So they extended it for six, you know, two, two, two months. So finally, next step, Actually, we are actually giving them the concerns. I think we brought the copies here of the letter going out from the county. Los Angeles Airport already sent their concern letter. It was much stronger. And I hope that city of Newport Beach, I'm not really sure, but uh, Mayor, are you sending it out, that letter? So September 8th is the due date that you put those concerns in. And then they're going to finalize it. And end of this year, they're going to send it back to us. Is that right, Courtney? They are the, required to respond. To right, respond by end of December that they're going to give us that exactly. Uh, Courtney, you want to come out a little more, explain about FAA? Anyway, I'm going to finish my speech. And then uh, Courtney is going to come out. And he's, she's going to explain a little more about the airport. So. We are watching it, we are monitoring it very closely and working with the city council members and we're going to work together so we want to have that FAA has your concerns and that's going to be reflected to um, you know, the, their next plan. We have a great actually office of five supervisors that I represent here but you know we all work together. One's been there, Sean Nelson, he's been there so he knows so much about county matters and you know, Todd Spitzer, chairman, he's from the public safety, so he understands how important public safety is. Lisa Bartlett, that she came from the city side, so she knows local city matters. And uh, Andrew Doe, she's from Cal Optima, and all these health care issues that he's, in, he's an expert. And me, I know how to count, so I can watch out your tax money. So if there's anything, open door policy. I have a business card here, I'm going to give it to you guys. And actually my uh, assistant, um, Tim, has a whole bunch of business cards. Get it. If you have anything, that please let us know. We have open door policy, we call you back, we talk to you person to person, and we try to solve this, you know, any problems, and we try to make this Orange County works better. But Courtney is going to come out, you know, explain a little more about FAA. She's been the expert, and she's a great person to, you know, ask all the questions. See, try to cover myself up, typical politician, you know, about FAA questions. But thank you very much for inviting me today. I'm going to come back for a few minutes. Supervisor Steele may be very soft-spoken, but I can tell you, having sat in the meeting with her in the FAA, she is a very strong advocate for you. Um, there was no mistaking um, her comments to the FAA that this is important and that the county would 
um, be very strong, very vocal, and very persistent um, in representing its constituents. Um, so the supervisor mentioned a little bit about what's happening. Um, the FAA has issued a draft environmental assessment for the SoCal Metroplex. Uh, this is one of a number of Metroplexes that FAA is studying as part of what they call their next generation air transportation system. Uh, a primary component of that is the move from ground-based navigation to satellite-based navigation. And what that means is that aircraft will be able to fly more precisely, more predictably, which for FAA translates to safety. Um, the supervisor mentioned what one of the results of that shift is less dispersion in flight tracks. And that is an issue that I think you all have seen here. Uh, we're also seeing that on the approach. So I do have copies actually. Um, I brought 50, I don't know if that's gonna be enough. Uh, so what we have is actually the comment letter to FAA that the Board of Supervisors approved on Tuesday. Um, the FAA did provide a period to comment on the draft environmental assessment. Um, it is an incredibly long, complicated technical document. Um, a number of folks have said you have to be an expert in Adobe to actually reach the diagrams that you need to see. So what we've done in here is to give you a copy of the county's comment letter, uh, which addresses a number of primary concerns, one of which of real interest to all of us is the preservation of the settlement agreement, which we know is very important to this community, uh, one of which is the county's recognition that the FAA does have the authority to manage airspace. That is their jurisdiction, that is their authority. The county has no authority to impact airspace design and operation. But with that said, that the FAA has a responsibility to include stakeholders in those conversations. And the first meeting that we had with Supervisor Steele, um, we asked, so you said you included stakeholders. Who, who are those stakeholders? And the answer was the airlines. <laughs> and Supervisor Steele's response was, that's not all of your stakeholders. We are your stakeholders. We need to be included. And that's referenced here in the county's letter. Um, we also identify for the FAA that when Congress created uh, the responsibility for next generation air transportation, it listed a whole series of goals for FAA. Clearly one of them is safety and security. We all fly, we want to be safe, we want to know that the airspace is being managed effectively. One of those goals was also environmental improvement, noise reduction, emission reduction. And when you look at the document that FAA has issued, that environmental goal is, it does not appear. Um, and so the county's basically said, Congress has told you that needs to be one of your goals. That's not been identified in your document. There are a number of other very specific issues here. Um, I will confess, I am not an airspace expert. We hired airspace experts. Um, but if you do have questions and you do have time, I will do my very best to answer. Oh, let me explain a couple of the other diagrams that you have. Um, the first uh, three diagrams that you have were actually provided at the public meetings that FAA held, which were very sparsely attended, by the way, which they will make note that they were very sparsely attended. So to the extent you care, um, those kinds of things are important that you attend. So the first three diagrams uh, show some of the different uh, procedures that FAA is proposing. Those were not part of the EA, the draft environmental assessment itself, but they were included at the public meeting. The last three pages are included in the draft environmental assessment. They are extremely difficult to find um, in the draft environmental assessment online. And this is a significant concern to us. We call these uh, the blob diagrams. I'm not sure that's a technical term. Um, but we told the FAA, these diagrams show that air traffic will occur in incredibly broad swaths of land. Very, very broad. And we've told them, we don't think that you have assessed the environmental effects of operations in those broad swaths. And if you do intend to operate there, you need to do that environmental work. Um, the map that is probably of most relevance to this community is the very last page in that handout which suggests that aircraft could make a left turn on departure from John Wayne prior to the coastline. Um, we don't think that's acceptable. We don't believe that you would think that's acceptable. And so that's why we're calling the FAA on that issue. 
if you really intend to have aircraft operations in that area, you need to identify that, you need to assess the environmental impact, and you need to provide that disclosure to the public. Um, that's the last comment in our letter, and we say it, of special concern to the county is that particular issue. Um, one comment that came up at the board meeting on Tuesday when this comment letter was discussed by the board, um, you will note the last sentence references that you need to completely disclose the environmental effects of your proposals and you need to meet your obligations under the National Environmental Policy Act and if you don't, your project could be subject to litigation. Um, Supervisor Spitzer, an attorney, um, felt that that was a threat. Um, from our perspective, uh, it was written by an attorney um, who works for us, but we're trying to make sure that FAA understands we will hold it accountable. It does have a responsibility under the federal law, and we expect that they will fully comply with that. We didn't say that the county would sue, and I believe there will be a closed session with the board at the end of this month about this particular process and what the remedies are. Um, but we do know that communities in San Diego, <coughs> excuse me, are concerned. We do know communities around Los Angeles are concerned. Uh, we do know that already a week before the comment period has closed, the FAA has received more than 300 comment letters. Um, this will not be an easy process, but I want to assure you that the county, the airport, is working very closely with the city of Newport Beach and communities to the north of us, uh, making sure that residents' concerns are expressed and that we do take advantage of the process that federal law allows. So I'll stop there and if you do have time and if you have questions, I will do my best. If we go to a satellite situation, there's always the possibility through hacking or whatever currently that that's not available. Is the ground on the system still going to be in place as a backup? That I do not know. I apologize. I don't know the answer to that question. <clears throat> Uh, sorry, the question was, if we do move to a satellite-based navigation system, will the ground-based systems continue to exist in the event there is a hack? Correct. And honestly, I just don't know the answer. Thank you. But it's a great question, I will, and I will ask. Did you say they're flying in a narrower path, and have they implemented that? Um, those of you who are kind of in the Duke, Duke to Strel conversation, um, FAA has attempted to move the easterly uh, departures onto uh, a satellite-based navigation system. Um, and those of you who were involved in this process may remember, um, they put in one, it's called Duke, they always have odd names, um, and Duke was dead wrong. We were not involved in that, the community was involved in that. So then they tried to adjust and implement Duke too. Well, that was wrong, had to adjust, and then they decided to shell the Duke name, and now they've moved it to Strel. Um, and so we've worked very closely with FAA on trying to get that right. So the departures out of John Wayne Airport going to easterly locations are on that, um, that using that technology. The northerly departures going up to the Bay Area, Portland, Seattle, which are on what are called the muscle and the channel standard instrument departures, are not. Um, the, the proposal here in this plan is that we will have the halo, the piggin, and the fins, um, which will all be using that GPS-based navigation. And FAA's intended goal is to reduce dispersion and to center those tracks on the bay. Not yet. Yes, ma'am. Why do the aircraft have to fly so low and then ascend? Um, Uh, what you will find here in Orange County is that we have residential communities a half mile off the end of our runway. Um, and we do have seven sets of noise monitors um, from the Santa Ana Heights area all the way out. Monitor seven is out around Newport Dunes. And we have noise limits associated with each of those monitors that the aircraft airlines have to comply with. And one of the reasons uh, that the aircraft do, some of them, not all of them, do that power reduction is in order to provide some noise benefit to the Santa Ana Heights community. Mm -hmm. um, 
Aircraft have gotten so much better, actually, that not all aircraft do the power reduction anymore. Some of them are able to go out full power and still meet the noise limits all the way down the bay. You mentioned something that we're passionate about. There's never been a noise monitor on Balboa Island. It's been requested, it's been denied. They don't want us to know how bad it is. Well, I can tell you it's not a matter of not wanting to know. Um, the answer is that the settlement agreement uh, that was entered into in 1985 um, has been grandfathered into the 1990 Airport Noise and Capacity Act, uh, which basically was created in part as a result of the settlement agreement here in Orange County. After we entered into that agreement with Newport and Spawn and AWG, other communities around the country started saying, hey, I like that. Hey, we'd like one of those. And the airlines went to Congress and said, this is not going to work for us to have a separate kind of agreement, a separate set of noise environment and noise requirements at every airport. And so Congress implemented legislation in 1990 that made it extremely difficult to have the kind of regulations that we have here. Um, Congressman Chris Cox was instrumental in getting our agreement grandfathered. What that means is we can have no additional noise restrictions. We can't change our noise restrictions. We can't add noise restrictions. We can't add regulatory noise monitors without the approval of the FAA. And since 1990, there has been no new restriction that's been approved. I, can, I am more than happy to do the analysis based on the data that we have. We can model for you what the noise at Balboa Island is. We can tell you pretty much to a pretty fine degree of certainty what the noise levels are um, based on the millions of data points we have from our existing noise monitoring system. I can tell you the noise at Balboa Island will not be the noise at Santa Ana Heights. But we can tell you what the noise is there. But what I'm saying is we cannot add a regulatory noise monitor at Balboa Island or we would potentially jeopardize our settlement agreement. I yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Okay. And there used to be an airport working group that worked with the city, all right? And we met with airport people. We met with a great many people. All I can tell you is that the FCC has decided they have ultimate rulings. There's nothing you can do to stop them. But I can show you the ladies. I even drew up some alternate. I don't know if anybody's around here from the airport working group a number of years ago. No hands? You probably all left or died. <laughs> uh, the airport working group still exists and is very active. And what are they doing? Uh, we've been working with them lately in terms of reviewing comments and reviewing the draft environmental assessment. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. What would you suggest uh, that residents do? We're directly through Michelle's office, or what, what is the path of most effective and impactful way to express the rest of the point of view? Um, it, with respect to the draft environmental assess, uh, assessment, I believe the city is submitting a comment letter, and that is the first stop. Um, those of you familiar with state and federal environmental law know that there is a very defined process. You identify the project, you assess the environmental impacts of the project, you provide that, you disclose those to the public and interested parties, they provide comments, there is a response to comments, and then a decision is made. So the next step is completion of comments by that uh, deadline next Tuesday that the supervisor mentioned. What we will have to wait for then is to see how FAA responds, whether or not they say, good point, we'll make that change, or sorry, we're going ahead. Um, when it comes to litigation, again, and the county has not threatened litigation, um, but the FAA has to fully comply with their federal environmental laws. Um, if they don't, they can be challenged in court, but there is no legal challenge available until FAA has made their decision. And just one other question. So that litigation reference is still included in Todd Spitzer's letter that was every It's still there. Right. It's, it's written very broadly. Yeah. It doesn't say, we, the county, will sue you. It says if you do not meet your federal environmental um, obligations, your project is subject to litigation. And my guess is there may be a number of parties throughout the Metroplex who may pursue that option. Courtney, would you verify for them that that September 8th deadline is the FAA imposed deadline? 
that is an FAA-imposed deadline. Um, you can provide comments in writing. You can provide your comments electronically via email. If anybody wants to catch me when we're finished, um, the written address is actually on the letter that we have. I'm happy to show you how to get to the website to look at the document itself and to find the email address to submit comments. Yes, sir. Uh, Courtney, uh, on the takeoff, uh, there was a question earlier about how you know, some of the planes can climb up. Uh, but there is a hard ceiling of 5,000 foot uh, for the approach to Long Beach. Uh, they do have to manage at the coastline where they are because of those approaches to Long Beach. That's so correct. So they can't go through the 5,000, even though the plane's getting lighter in the east of the they can't go through that. There a requirement that maybe they can turn the other go back to full power until after they've gone by, say, a few miles beyond the coastline instead of you know, almost accelerating over the Palmer Island? Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to your question. When it comes to the county's jurisdiction, what, what we can do is say, you have to meet these noise limits at these noise monitors. When it comes to where power is applied or reapplied, when the aircraft is cleaned up and flaps and slats are retracted, um, that is all a process that occurs between the air carrier and the FAA. And as we know, in Southern California, we have incredibly congested airspace. We get calls a lot of times on aircraft that are approaching or departing Long Beach, approaching or departing Burbank, LAX. Um, so I, I don't know if there are changes that could be made there. It used to be in the car route in Long Beach, you have know, you know, you know, feet wet. It was my understanding that reapplication of power wouldn't occur until past the coastline. But again, I'm not, I don't know what instruction control, air traffic control is giving the carriers. That's something that if you want to chat with me, I'm happy to pursue that and I'm happy to ask a question. Yes, and I'm happy to stick around. Thank you. Michelle, if you could come back up for a minute. Yes, thank you very much, Courtney. That was very enlightening. I think we all do appreciate that it really is the FAA that has kind of the final word on all of this. Um, I'd like to bring Michelle back up for a minute, so if she has any closing remarks or if you have any questions specific to Michelle, that uh, she has a very tight time limit, and if anyone has a question for Michelle, go ahead. Actually, there's a flight path that's been changed you know, by FAA, and actually we found out that we got the complaint from, you know, when you don't make noise, you know, we really don't know because I don't live under that path. So people complained that we found out, so we asked, airport actually asked FAA to change that back to the normal route, right? So they are actually, they found out it was their error, so, you know, they're going to change it uh, by middle of this month. So. We are working very closely with residents. And at the same time, Diane, you were asking me about that, you know, how we're gonna work with, you know, county. Actually, congressmen are working very closely with us, Dana Rohrbacher and Ed Royce, and you know, they are very much closely working and they know exactly what issues that in FAA and the federal level of work. So we are working very closely together. Yeah, port of entry and that's another thing too. So, you know, we are con constantly working you know, with Congressman for the airport issue. Yes. Um, you were addressing earlier in your remarks that the, the corridor for takeoff is getting um, many more flights now. Is that part of that correction? No, no. There's no corrections. That's why our concern on the letters say that the settlement agreement cannot be changed. So that was our concern between, you know, City of Newport Beach and what we actually signed last year, less than one year ago, that, you know, we signed a settlement agreement that has to stay the way it is. Courtney is going to stay here. She is the expert on airport. I know kind of like out, you know, broad way, and I'm working with, you know, elected people side. So she's the expert on, you know, airport issues. So if you have more questions, then ask Courtney. That's why I brought Courtney here and she is great. So thank you very much today. Anything, just send me an email. I'm going to respond right away. Thank you. thank you very much, Michelle. We really appreciate that informative.
presentation on issues including, but not exclusive to, the airport. <laughs> and there are a lot of issues in the county, as you know. And uh, Michelle's assistant, Tim, and Courtney will stick around after the meeting if you have any other questions. But in the meantime, to close, I'd like to bring up Steve Rosansky to give us just a quick update on what's coming up at the chamber. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Dorothy. And thank you, Michelle, for being our guest this morning. And Courtney, for um, explaining all this uh, esoteric kind of material to us and for staying afterwards to uh, answer questions. Uh, we do have a few events coming up in the next uh, month or so that I just want to quickly go over. Um, next week, our, we're going to have our monthly uh, business lecture series at the uh, Bahia Corinthian Yacht Club. Our guest uh, next week will be Tracy Virtue. She's going to be talking about presenting yourself, your company, and your ideas. Um, you can go and sign up online or call the office to register for that. It's $25, and that'll be Wednesday, September 16th from 11.30 to 1.30. Um, our next major event coming up is our lifeguard and, our, I'm sorry, our firefighter and lifeguard appreciation dinner. This year it's a little different. We're moving over to the uh, Marriott Hotel. It's going to be a big blowout event there. Uh, we're going to have three buff buffet tables, hand pass hors d'oeuvres. Uh, the police are going to get jealous. Oh, they already left. You guys are going to be jealous this year. They always had the best, uh, the best thing, but I think the firefighters are going to wind up you guys this year. In any event, um, they're, they're pulling out all the stops. Uh, if you want to uh, join us for that, you can register online at uh, www.newportbeach.com, and the cost for that is, uh, I believe it's $50. Uh, we're also looking for some, still looking for sponsors for that event, if you're interested. Two days later, we're going to have an event right here at City Hall in the Civic Green. We're going to do our first uh, Newport Beach Eco Expo. We're calling it Green on the Green. And we're going to have probably about 30 different exhibitors. Um, we're going to have an e-waste drop-off, uh, document shredding. Uh, we're going to have a half a dozen electric and hybrid vehicles from different car manufacturers on display. And some of them are the, you know, brand new models that are just out this month. Uh, we're going to have uh, probably at least a half a dozen, or I'm sorry, a dozen environmental groups, another dozen or 15 businesses that have eco-friendly products and things that they want to demonstrate for you. Uh, we're going to be programming the community room. I think someone was here from the Newport Bay. Is she still here? There she is. They're going to be programming uh, uh, some stuff for kids and, and adults too, I think, in the community room. Big kids, yeah. So it should be a lot of fun, and that's a free event. It'll be from 10 to uh, 3 on Saturday, September 19th. Please feel free to join us. I think the CERT people are also going to be doing an event down here out in the courtyard as well, so you can get two for the price of one, and they're both free, so what a great deal. Um, our next uh, major event after that is going to be our 54th annual Sandcastle Building Contest at Corona Del Mar Beach. If you haven't ever gone, it's a great event. Last year we had 25 teams and it ranged from you know, little kids all the way to you know, big adults making really professional looking uh, sandcastles. George Leslie here has been our, uh, our uh, chief commodore in charge of that event for years. He's sort of passing the baton off to, where is he? There he is, Larry Smith. But uh, it's going to be a great event this year. We're going to have uh, 15 or 20, uh, uh, we're hoping to have 15 or 20 woodies on the beach too. It's an additional thing. And I think we're going to have uh, the bubble man for kids. So you'll be able to do bubbles on the beach. It'll be a lot of fun. Another free event. And then last but not least, I want to mention our 2016 economic forecast. Every year the city, I mean the chamber, I'm sorry, does a, a, an economic forecast. This year is particularly uh, special because we partnered with the UCLA Anderson School of Business, and they're going to be providing the UCLA Anderson forecast as part of our event. If you don't know, UCLA is like one of the top business schools in the country. Anderson is, I think, ranked 13th on the U.S. News and World Report. So um, their, their forecast is uh, well respected and, and widely looked at. So we'll have two speakers from the forecast. One will be talking about uh, state and national forecasting. The other one will focus more on Orange County. <clears throat> Excuse me, and our third guest will be Ed Fuller. He's the president of the Orange County Visitors Association. He's going to be talking about uh, tourism and what we can expect in 2016. Tourism is a huge driver here in the county, and especially in Newport Beach. I mean, the TOT tax revenues that are generated by the city's hotels are, are a big part of our budget, as well as, you know, uh, well, Jim can attest, Jim Walker from the bungalow can attest, you know, what it does for his restaurant. Bring, oh, there he is, Jim Walker, and Kay, his wife. Um, for his restaurant, but uh, tourism, big business here in town as well as the county, so he can be talking about that. He's actually an expert on Asian tourism as well. He uh, opened, I think, over four or 500 hotels for Marriott while he worked you know, for Marriott for 40 years. And so if you've been watching the stock market lately and seeing what's happening 
in China with their market crashing and other Asian markets, um, you know, people are not as rich, they don't feel like spending money on traveling, it might affect our economy. A lot of homes here in Newport Beach and Irvine and other communities are bought with cash by overseas money. But uh, if you, you lost 10 or 20 or 30% of the stock market, you might not be buying homes here. So it'll be interesting to see his take as well. And then last but not least, next month at Wake Up Newport, uh, we'll be here again October 1st, do something a little different. We're going to have a panel discussion on the new minimum wage laws that are coming into effect. If you don't know it, minimum wage is going to go up, I mean, in some places up to $15 an hour, which is pretty significant, for, as Jim Walker, will, who owns a restaurant, will tell you. Uh, and any, any small business owner will tell you that. You know, even if you're not paying minimum wage, it still creates compression. And you know, your workers that are making, you know, if minimum wage is 10, they're being paid 12 on that, and it goes up to 12, they want to be paid 14 or 15. So it's not even just the ones that are at the minimum. It, it moves up the food chain and creates uh, you know, additional expense. So we'll have uh, someone from the, uh, I think, the vice president of the California Restaurant Association, right, right. who will be our guest. And we're still uh, trying to fill uh, two more slots. We'll probably have an economist that will talk about the effects of minimum wage increases. And someone from the labor side will talk about you know why they think um, you know it's important to be increasing minimum wage for uh, for workers. So thank you all for coming. I want to thank uh, Edible Arrangements again for the food, and I also want to mention thank uh, Michelle for bringing the the pastry treats this morning. They were delicious. I think there's still a few left uh, back there. So please help yourself to anything on the way out, and we'll see you next month. Oh, one last thing, Jim will kill me if I don't mention that if you're not a chamber member, why not? Please see him on the way out. Thank you for coming.